Welcome back to the Steady Anchor Podcast. I am Luke, your host, and today we are continuing our series through the creeds and councils of the early church. This is episode number 67. Today we're discussing the Chalcedonian definition and the formula of union. So again, that's the definition of faith that was put out by the Council of Chalcedon in 451, and the formula of union, which solidified the two parties over the Council of Ephesus in 431. So we'll be talking today in kind of continuation of the last couple episodes. We've been doing this series through the various creeds and ecumenical councils of the early Christian church. Um, We believe, and I believe especially, that it's important for us to understand our history as believers, as part of this one church. Um, This is not just meaningless, you know, academic exercise. It's it's learning our own history as a people, that when we read these words, we are reading about uh, the discussion of our Savior, about how the church that we are a part of has fought to define these terms carefully and correctly and biblically. And so when we go through and we talk about these different creeds and councils and these various definitions and formulas and stuff, it's not just meaningless academic adventures, right? The whole point is to is to learn more about who God is and hopefully learning from some of the, the godly men and women who have come before us to help us in that. And so today... Uh, We're going to be reading some of the documents specifically from these councils. We did the Council of Ephesus Ephesus two episodes ago, and last episode was uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So today, uh, before we address the theological arguments of these various parties against the Orthodox party and understanding, which we'll do next week, Uh, We're just going to go through and read the documents themselves, because I think it's important. It really is a distillation of all the stuff we've talked about so far. Um, That This is a summation of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the the Creed of Constantinople, which expanded upon Nicaea. Uh, These creeds, again, they don't want to add more and more creeds for people to have to keep memorizing and keep debating. They just want to to clarify and refine what the church has already said based upon the testimony of the scriptures. And so we'll start off with the the formula of union. But before we get there, I just want to welcome another show into our podcasting network. This is the third week in the row. I am excited to announce another show is joining the Society of Reformed Podcasters. Uh, Two weeks ago, it was... Um, the Five Points Church Planning Podcast, and last week it was the Grandpappy Podcast, and this week it's the Guilt, Grace, and Gratitude Podcast. Um, I'm recording this early, so I hope that Tony and Jesse have already announced this on their show by the time I post, but um, it's official for us. So so welcome to the Guilt, Grace, and Gratitude Podcast. I'm excited to have them on. I've loved the episodes I've heard from them so far. Uh, this is giving me a couple episodes to go back and listen. Uh, most of the shows, when they join, I've already heard all their episodes, so that'll be nice to have another couple things to catch up on, and I can use that with what's going on this week. So yeah, I'm recording this a couple of days earlier than I normally do. I try to post on Wednesdays, but today I'm recording a few days earlier because of just some strange stuff going on this week. Last week, after my last recording, I was out of town for a few days with my mom's graduation. She just got her master's. I'm, I'm happy for her, very proud for of her. Um, and then <laughs> this week, kind of last minute, I agreed to go with a friend on a work trip with him to Columbus. So I'm going to be driving from Illinois to Ohio about seven hours and then losing another hour. So that's going to be a wild time. And I'll be gone for a few days and then back. So I wanted to record this ahead of time. Um, so if you're taking any, you know, seven-hour road trips, you know, I definitely go to the other Society for Forum podcasters and do some downloading and have a good time. I'm certainly going to enjoy some of the other podcasts in the network when I'm driving because that's what I love to do. I I really like taking advantage of those long drives just to continue learning, continue studying, continue being uh, uplifted and edified by the content that's being produced by other great people around us. I'm really happy that the Society of Podcasters keeps growing because 
Um, not only am I joined to get to know these other godly guys, but I'm really encouraged by all the stuff they're producing, and I hope you are as well. So getting into the topic for today. This is the Formula of Union from 433. A quick recap of what happened with the Council of Ephesus. There was a monk named Nestorius who eventually became the Patriarch of Constantinople, which was the seat of the empire. Um, He was known as kind of a heresy hunter. He was looking to defend what he believed to be right doctrine, which in itself is a good thing. But in many ways, he was overzealous or untactful in the ways that he did it. He also had some theological problems of his own, which left him open to attack. One such theological problem was the way that he articulated the nature of Christ and his incarnation. So so Nestorius was basically, it starts with the issue of calling Mary the mother of God. He argued that Mary should not be called the mother of God and only called the mother of Christ because she did not give birth to the divine nature. She only gave birth to the human nature of Jesus. So she can be called the the bearer of Christ, the person of Christ, but not the bearer of God because she did not give birth to the divine nature. And the problem that this caused leads to an underlying problem in Nestorius' theology, which separates, uh, separates either by his own statements or by logical necessity the person of Christ into two separate persons with two separate natures. Um, he either ma- he made statements even controversial enough as like, I couldn't serve a God that was that was given birth to. I couldn't serve a God that was in diapers, right? And to, a, to on a surface level, that makes sense. But you dig down deeper into all the problems that it had that causes with our Christology, with our understanding of who Christ is at the very basic level that now there's two Christ, there's two persons of Jesus. And that is, that it adds another Savior. There's two Saviors, there's two sons, there's basically four people in the Trinity. There's a whole bunch of problems that come with that. And if you're looking for a greater, deeper explanation of that, you can go to our previous episode, or you can read uh, some great resources on this. You can find a lot of good books. If you are looking for some of those resources, you can message me and I'll be happy to be able to help you find them. Uh, you can also go look through stuff in our podcast network. I know that Tony and Jesse at Reform Brotherhood have done episodes before on Nestorianism and Eutychianism and the hypostatic union, and they do it a lot deeper, more clear and technical level than I can. So definitely go check them out if you want more. You can also go and read the primary sources, some of which we'll be diving into today. If you want to deal with the problem of Nestorianism, I'd urge you to go to uh, the second letter of Cyril to Nestorius, which is the one that was accepted by the council as Orthodox. So the way that they understood the natures of Christ to relate to one another and the person of Christ uh, was clarified and in a clear enough way in Cyril's second letter to Nestorius that they said, yes, that's biblical. We're going to accept that as our understanding because it's a meaningful enough definition that the way he phrases his arguments and whatnot. So if you're looking for something deeper there, that's a great primary source for you to look into. Now, we're not going to read that full letter today just because it's a bit longer. It is a more expansive argument, and it's going to, it would be too difficult maybe for what I'm trying to do here. What we will do instead is read the Formula of Union, which was signed and agreed upon by both parties after the whole debacle. Uh, If you go back and listen to the history of what happened at at, uh, Ephesus, there was uh, two councils that both condemned one another, and then... um, uh, and then the, the imperial powers came and negated them both and put them all on house arrest, and they all ran away, basically. And it wasn't until two years later, at 433, that there was a statement that they could both agree on meaningfully. Now, not either of them would adopt them as official statements, but at least both parties, led by Cyril of Alexandria on one side and John of Antioch on the other side, could agree to this formula of union. And so we'll just go through and read this short and and core passage from the Formula of Union now. So, of course, they begin with the desire to be unified against the schemes of the devil who desires to to divide the church. They are 
desiring for clarity and consistency and unity within the body of Christ. They confess a faith in the faith handed down once and for all from the saints and the holy scriptures and the teachings of the apostles, which we know from the New Testament writings. Um, they confess what, hap- what was declared at Nicaea and Constantinople and and. They seek to clarify that with this formula of union and with what was declared as orthodox at Ephesus. And so this was, I think if I have it right, it was sent to Cyril of Alexandria from John of Antioch's party trying to find kind of a middle ground where they could both agree on this. And they were in schism almost over this. They were so divided that this was really you know, one of the last-ditch efforts to make sure that the the church didn't split over this issue. And so they wrote this statement. It's only about a—it's a long paragraph, and I'll make commentary as we go through. So, the formula of union from 433. We confess, then, our Lord Jesus Christ, the unique Son of God, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and body. So we'll stop there. They're confessing again of one person— of Jesus Christ, who is the monogenes theos. He's the unique, only begotten Son of God, who is perfect God and perfect man. He is he is truly divine, and he is truly human. He possesses, in some sense, both of these natures in his incarnation. And he has a reasonable soul and a true body, which means that he's not, as Apollinaris would teach, or his students would teach, that that the spirit of the Son inhabited the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Neither was it, as the Docetists and the Gnostics would say, that the Spirit just came and appeared to have a body. No, Jesus truly came in the flesh, with a human soul and body, but also being of a perfect divine nature, as well as the perfect human nature. Continuing, it says, the begotten of the Father before the ages, according to the Godhead. The same in the last days, for us and for our salvation, born of the vir- of Mary the Virgin, according to the manhood. So in his divine nature, he is the eternal Son who has always been with the Father. The Son has always had a Father. The Father has always had the Son. They are co-equal, co-eternal members of the triune Godhead, along with the Spirit. But in his human nature, in these days, these last days, which we know from the New Testament is the time of the Incarnation, you know, you have a lot of people talking about, well, we're in the last days now. Well, if you read the New Testament, we've been in the last days since Christ came. Uh, Hebrews 1.1, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by the Son. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. But that's besides the point. So, in his humanity, he has come and been born of the Virgin Mary in his humanity, in his divinity, always the eternal Son of God. Continuing, the same consubstantial with the Father in Godhead and consubstantial with us in manhood. So, it uses the same word there, consubstantial, in Greek it's homoousios, Uh, which means of the same nature. So in his divinity, he is of the exact same nature as the Father. In his humanity, he is the the exact same nature as us, continuing for a union of the two natures took place. Therefore, we confess one Christ, one Son, one Lord. According to this understanding of the unconfused union, we confess the Holy Virgin to be Theotokos, That's the word we were talking about, this big debate. Should Mary be called the mother of God? And the creed and the council says yes. And again, this is not to elevate Mary. They honored her, especially in the early churches. We should honor her as an obedient servant of Christ in our day. But, you know, it's not referring to the the elevation of Mary that happens in especially Roman Catholic circles. No, the title Theotokos is more about saying who Christ is. Than saying who Mary is. Continuing, because God the Word was made flesh and lived as man, and from the very conception united to himself the temple taken from her, referring to his physical body. As to the evangelical and apostolic phrases about the Lord, that's the Gospels and the New Testament, 
We know that theologians treat some, and the history of the church and the context here. We know that the theologians treat some in common as of one person and distinguish others as of the two natures and interpret the God-befitting ones in connection with the Godhead of Christ and the humble ones of the manhood. So this last uh, phrase of this core paragraph is referring to the way that scriptures and after the scriptures, many theologians of the church uh, will sometimes use this communication of attributes in their language, where sometimes we attribute something of the human nature to the divine nature and sometimes to the divine nature of the human nature. So the example we used from the New Testament, where it says that God purchased a people for himself by his blood, referring in some sense to the divine nature, and yet the divine nature is spiritual and spiritual, which means that it does not have blood. It cannot be cut, nor can it bleed. And so this is something that Scripture uses to explain this incarnation, this miracle of the hypostatic union, which we'll see more in the next portion. But it explains it in such a way that uh, it's important for us to understand that even when the human nature is described in some sense with divinity, and in some sense the divinity is attached to the humanity, it's not mixing the two. But neither is this understanding of the Incarnation separating Christ, because it's essential, again, to affirm that the Son is the Son. There are not two sons, but there is only one. That the Son who has been with the Father from all eternity is the same Son who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, resurrected, and is now at the same side of his Father. So we believe in one Son, but we believe that he was truly God and truly man. Now there's still some area of, of openness here because it's not using the language of one person in two natures which is why two decades later there'll still be conflict and have to be another council to resolve the issue. Uh, if you're looking for uh, where I'm reading this, I'm reading a definition from a book called The Christology of the Later Fathers by Hardy. It's a book that I had for a class uh, last year. So that is the essential part of the formula of union from 433. So that is Cyril reads this, he agrees to it, he says, yes, this is essentially what I was trying to argue along. I can agree to this. And so he writes back to John of Antioch saying, I agree to this and praise God for it. Let heaven and earth rejoice for the wall that divided us has now been broken down. And I hope that are they that a lot of these dividing walls between us theologically can also be broken down, not for the sake of just a a facsimile of peace, but that the Church of Christ can have true unity over the truth of God's scriptures. So that's the formula of union. Moving on to the definition of Chalcedon from 451, because again, they don't want to make another creed per se. They want to hold to the creed of Nicaea, Nicaea and confirmed at Constantinople as the one official creed of the church, but because of the ambiguity of language and the continuing disagreements and arguments, they need to continue defining things and expanding just enough that it's made clear what is meant in Nicaea. So, this is the definition of Chalcedon. Sorry, I got to scroll down to it real quick. I'm using an ebook, and I unfortunately don't have a computer mouse at the time. Well, I have a mouse, but it's. Uh, the battery died a long time ago, and I've been too lazy to replace it. So, all right. So they begin uh, with the official statement of the the Council of Chalcedon by affirming what was said at Nicaea and Constantinople by reaffirming the expanded Nicene Creed as the definition of the faith. Um, they go on and clarify a bit about the Holy Spirit and some of the conflict that's arisen since then. They go on to affirm the orthodoxy of Cyril's second letter to Nestorius, um, the letter of to uh, the Tome of Leo, um, and, um, and the letter of Cyril to John of Antioch. So they affirm Cyril's second letter, they affirm the formula of union, and they affirm the Tome of Leo, which was Leo's explanation for Ephesus in 431. 
And so they continue with their own new articulation with this, saying that, For the council opposes those who try to divide this mystery of the dispensation into a dyad of sons. So we'll stop there already. What it's saying here in somewhat arcane language, not exactly clear, especially dispensation, because it's not meaning here what we would mean by dispensationalism. That's a very different topic. What it's saying here is the council of Constantinople opposes those who would divide the mystery of the incarnate Christ into two separate sons, into two separate persons. So they're starting by affirming what was declared at Ephesus. They're starting by affirming against uh, the people who would say that the son had two persons and two natures. They're saying that's definitely not what we believe. Continuing on, and those who dare to say that the Godhead of the only begotten is passable, and it expels from them the company of, pe- of priests. And it resists those who think of a mixture or confusion of the two natures of Christ. And it drives away those who fancy the form of a servant which he took of us was a heavenly or some other substance. And those who imagine two natures of the Lord before the union, but invent one after the union, it anathematizes. So this is their first main declaration of what they condemn at Chalcedon. They condemn Nestorius' error, or at least what he was perceived to be saying, that Christ was two persons and two natures. They say that's not biblical, that's not theologically accurate, it's not logically sensible, it's not consistent with what we believe as followers of Christ about what Jesus said about himself. But we also disagree with those who say that the divinity, the divine nature of Christ is passable and changeable, that uh, that somehow Jesus changed his divinity in assuming humanity. Now, there's a lot of important parts about just that phrase and, and the theological conversations today, because there's a lot of people in the church who would claim to be Orthodox evangelicals who do believe that the Godhead is passable. They do believe that God changes, that God changes his mind, that he repents, that he changes his emotions, that he changes his character, that he gets stuff wrong and corrects himself. And this, of course, would be considered the worst of heresies by the early church because it is so contrary to what is taught in the scriptures, that, that the, in him is no shadow due to change, that in him is no change, for he is not a son of man that he should change it or change his mind. That is the testimony of the scriptures, that, that even with that anthropomorphic language, we have the clarification that he does not change in his being that who God is, is who God is. The divinity in no way diminished or changed when Christ was united to his human nature. And you also see this error in a lot of uh, churches that espouse what's called uh, the canonic theory, the idea that Christ in his incarnation emptied himself of divinity. And there's a lot of churches, even like Bethel Redding, where fall at least close to this error in emphasizing the humanness of Christ so much that they almost devalue his divinity. So theology is important. The way we articulate this is important. And the church has been dealing with these issues since the beginning. They also want to deny against those who say that these two natures are mixed together in the incarnation, that uh, that that in some way, before the incarnation, there was the human nature, which came from Mary, and the divine nature, which came from the Godhead. But in the incarnation, they kind of fused into its own new nature. They also want to deny against those who say that his human nature was some other type of human nature, a, a purified heavenly human nature that isn't like our human nature. They condemn and anathematize these things. That's what anathema means. It means condemnation. It means damnation. Because if Christ is is not truly God and truly man, then as we've already said, he cannot accomplish our salvation. Because what Scripture testifies to and what was understood by the early church and by all Orthodox Christians today is that Christ redeems everything that he assumes in the Incarnation. So if he assumes a partly human nature, or part of a human nature, or a mixed human nature, then he doesn't redeem all of our human nature. Continuing on, 
Following, therefore, the Holy Fathers, we confess one and the same Lord Jesus Christ, and we all teach harmoniously the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Vera Deus and Veri Homo is the Latin, and I just think that's a lot of fun. Um, it's something that I love hearing R.C. Sproul talk about. And uh, this is, I'm recording on the anniversary of his death three years ago today, which I even remember when I heard the news. I was relatively new to Reformed theology, and R.C. Sproul had been so instrumental, instrumental into me coming to a biblical understanding of Christianity. Um, so it was hard on me, but I love the guy, and I'm grateful for his ministry to the church, even though I disagree with him in some things. Uh, besides the point, um, truly God and truly man, the same of a reasonable soul and body. So um, kind of just reaffirming what was that the formula of union and all previous councils, uh, consubstantial with the Father in Godhead, and the same consubstantial with us in manhood like us in all things except sin, begotten before the ages of the Father in Godhead, the same in the last days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, Theotokos, in his manhood, one in the same Christ, Lord, Son, unique, acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. So we have here the more clear definition that Christ is one person, there is one Christ, one Son, one Lord, one only begotten of the Father, but he is acknowledged as incarnate in two natures, and then it gives four negations. It's without confusion or change or division or separation, that in the incarnation, the two natures were not confused together and mixed into a separate type of nature. Uh, that one nature did not change into the other nature, and that these natures are not divided or separated to such a degree that there are two separate persons. They explain the difference of the natures being by no means taken away because of the union, but rather the distinctive character of each person being preserved, and each combining in one person and hypostasis. That's person. It's It's one person in two natures, and this is where we get the term, the theological term, the hypostatic union, because it is the union of two natures in one hypostasis, one person. Continuing, not divided or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God, Word, Lord, Jesus Christ. As the prophets of old and the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us about him, and the symbol, symbol of the fathers handed down to us. And then they go on to explain again that they are, they are explaining these things with great care and that they don't want to offer another creed, but rather just reaffirm what was said through Nicaea and all the way back to what was said by Christ and his apostles about himself. They want to reaffirm solid and sound biblical truth because, because Christ in his beauty, in the miracle of the hypostatic union, is God in the flesh. He has come and made like one of us, made in all ways as we are, tempted in the flesh and, and yet without sin. And that is mysterious to us. It is in many ways beyond our understanding or our capability that our finite minds cannot contain the infinite nature of Godhead, much less how that is united to a humanity in time and in reality. So, if we were to dismiss this as, as you know, it's high and high, mighty theology, it's, it's, it's ivory tower stuff, it doesn't matter, we would miss not only a more glorious and beautiful and biblical picture of who Christ is, but we would also be missing out on very important things that this tells us about our salvation. Again, that Christ assuming what it truly means to be human means that we who are truly human can be united to him. And through being united to the same human nature with him, through faith, we also can be united to the divine nature of him. That being united to Christ as sons and daughters of the living God, through faith, by grace, 
then we can truly be called the sons of God ourselves. The miracle of the incarnation that we're coming up on on uh, Christmas, or um, as as Tony and Jesse like to call it, uh, winter no reason gift giving season or whatever they call it. Um, we're coming upon a time where a lot of people slow down and try and think more about what it means that God became one of us. And again, like I hold to the regulative principle of worship. I know that the New Testament doesn't command us to celebrate holy days like we did in the Old Testament. We have 52 holy days. Every Sunday is a holy day that we have been called to worship in. But I also think that it would be it would be lacking for us to miss this opportunity where even a largely secular hol- secular culture is still slowing down for a specific purpose. And underneath all of the wrappings of commercialism and materialism and selfishness and this kind of moralizing of Christmas, where it's not about the incarnation of God coming to save his people, it's now about family and and gifts and jolliness and Santa Claus and you know, and big family dinners, but that's illegal now, apparently, because of COVID, um, that underneath all of those wrappings, the, the truth is still there, that the, the underlying Judeo-Christian worldview still shines through in the midst of this, that it is only with reference to God among us that we can truly say that there is anything special about this season or any other season, Because the miracle of the Incarnation, the miracle of the hypostatic union, is what we can put our hope in. That God is not distant. He is not far away. He is able to sympathize with us because he became like one of us. He assumed the weakness of our flesh. And and where we are tempted and fall into temptation and sin, he was tempted and yet carried on his strength. That where the first Adam failed, he succeeded. Where all the prophets, priests, and kings of all of humanity have failed in their duties to God and to man, Christ has not failed. Christ does not fail, and Christ will not fail. And so my encourage you, my encouragement for you today is to rest and trust in his promises. That even though the hypostatic union is something that may be beyond our knowledge and and Listen, this is a half hour just barely scratching the surface of all the stuff and the research, the, the doctrine, the biblical exegesis that we could do on this topic. But I just want to give you a picture, maybe help you to get a little hungry for this yourself, to see that this is beautiful. It is true, it is encouraging, and it is eminently practical. And I hope that encourages you for the rest of this week. Um. Next week, be on the lookout for the episode on Nestorianism and Eutychianism versus Orthodoxy. Um, you can find us on social media at Stanker, Steady Anchor Pod. Sorry for tongue twisted for some reason tonight. You can message us through there if you have any questions or clarifications, you have any concerns, you want me to elaborate, you want me to help you find some resources. I love doing that for people because I run different pages and stuff on social media because I've been working on this podcast and other stuff. I've gotten a lot of messages, some a lot from people who are looking to go deeper into these things. And it is one of my favorite things, despite this pandemic, to be able to spend more time helping people and other parts of the world find these resources and go deeper in their faith. So despite not being able to go and see other people in person, at least God is working some good and giving me more time to reach out to people who I would never meet in person. So we've had listeners from the Philippines, from India and Indonesia, from Canada, from Australia. We've had people from, gosh, what was it? There was, let me see if I can look it up real quick. They had Uh, A number of listens from an Asian city just in these last few weeks. I'm pulling up the the page so I can tell you because this really was astounding to me Um, and super encouraging to see that that God can be using, um, can be using what I'm talking about, can be using these conversations that I basically have with the air to be reaching people around the world. Um, 
So like just this week, we had listeners from Canada, Australia, the UK, Philippines, uh, India, Indonesia. But what was, what was that last one? Dang it. Sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Singapore. Yeah, that's what it was. And in the last month, we've had 131 plays from Singapore. And that just blew me away. Like the idea that 131 times someone would want to listen or at least be interested enough to click on these episodes. Like I am I am so grateful for uh, what God has done in, in allowing me to have these theological conversations. And it really just reflects on how good and how glorious that he is that uh, good theology is contagious. It really is that when you get people excited about the deep truths of God, it gets other people excited too. So sorry for that last minute tangent. I'll let you go now. Thanks again for listening. I appreciate it. Let me know if you need any questions or any clarification or anything. We'll see you next week. Until then, love God, love his church, and love your neighbor as yourself.